welcome to the worship service of the First Baptist Church of Marion, Illinois. Located just two blocks west of Tower Square near downtown Marion, this vibrant and energetic church meets weekly for high-energy, Christ-centered services. Enjoy the warm fellowship of the First Baptist family. We pray God's Spirit will be evident in our service and that you will want to come and see what First Baptist of Marion is all about. our time together. Father, you are a holy God, an awesome God. And Father, we love to have fun because, Lord, when we're in you, you lead us to fellowship. And Father, fellowship is a wonderful thing. And we just pray, Lord, that as we worship you today, we are in agreement that you are a wonderful, loving, saving God. And we've come to sing about you today. We've come to submit ourselves to you. We've come to hear uh, your word preached so that we can get our lives in line with what your will is. So, Father, let us worship you in spirit and in truth, and let us fellowship together in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so glad that you're here today. We want to welcome you to our services. It's at this time in our service where we shake some hands and greet our guests. So, if you would, stand with me, and let's uh, welcome all of our guests here to First Baptist Church, Marion, Illinois. We're going to sing a song this morning. The choir is going to sing a song. And like I said earlier, we're not singing to you. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're worshiping with us, but we're not singing to you. We've been practicing in this song for our Lord and our Savior, our living 
Savior. Not just Savior, not just in words. He's living today, folks. If you don't believe that, I'm sorry, you're wrong. He's living right now, and he's coming back to get us. It may not be in my lifetime, it may not be in your lifetime, but he's coming back. And he's going to take us home. This song says, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. So as we sing, I want you to pray in your hearts, pray out loud. If you even feel it, you want to come to the altar and pray about it, go ahead. That's what this altar's for. It's, it's to pray. So let's pray to our Lord this morning. Stay standing. We got one more song to sing. We get to sing one more song. We're allowed to sing one more song. Glorious day. Glorious day.
There are days when I feel the best of me is ready to begin. Then there are days when I feel I'm letting go and so. reminder to us to get on our knees you know we haven't said much about the fact that uh, Brian is not here today uh, John Odell has done a wonderful job of filling in for us and we appreciate John <laughs> filling in Brian is on vacation he is visiting his daughter and son-in-law Katie and Trevor and his good friends Mickey and Minnie Mouse in Florida so uh, hats off to Brian today it is instilled in our culture to want better things. If you spend any time at all watching commercial television, you know that it is full of commercials. And all commercials try to get you to believe that you need their better thing, right? That's their whole goal. Well, I want you to know that uh, as I mentioned last week as we were leaving, uh, I went uh, on a mission uh, tour uh, in Boston, Massachusetts last week. And I left here and, and grabbed something to eat and then got on an airplane. But I want you to know that the North American Mission Board always uses your mission dollars wisely. We never fly luxury. We never fly first class. Did you know that there's a difference between first class and economy. Did you all know that? Well, let me show you. This is first class. If you want luxury sleep, that's first class. 
Now, in economy, it looks more like uh, this. <laughs> now, if you're flying luxury and you want to sleep, there's actually an airline. Go on to the next one. There's actually an airline that will put you in a bed in a plane and will tuck you in. Tuck you in before you go to sleep. Now, in the economy class, it looks more like this. Uh, I always refuse the tuck in myself, but uh, that's, it looks a little more like it. And go on to the next one. In first class, sometimes you get a meal on your flight, you know. But on the economy flight, it's more like this. That's good. Okay. Well, I always have an airplane story to tell you when I come back. And so this is no different. On, we left St. Louis and went, uh, my goal was to get to Detroit. <laughs> Why they flew me to Detroit first instead of going to Boston, I don't know. But that's what economy class does. It takes you on a world, uh, United States tour before it gets you to where you need to be. So I'm trying to get to, to Detroit. Got on uh, Cape Air flight here in Marion. Everything was great, uh, on time. Waiting in St. Louis, my plane to take me to Detroit was 30 minutes late, which means that I only had a few minutes to try to catch my flight, my connecting flight from Detroit to Boston. So I'm getting a little bit nervous. I'm thinking, oh man, I'm not gonna make this. I'm not gonna make this. And, 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 and then I find out I, I'm, I've got about 10 minutes to spare. I'm on the ground. I go to the, the ticket counter. I say, tell me, what gate? We came in on A-10. A-10. What gate is my plane leaving from? A-76. <laughs> so then I start running toward that gate. And, and, I, and, and you know, it's kind of funny. Music came over the uh, intercom to chariots of fire dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. the music was playing fine and guess what I was running in slow motion uh, I get to my gate and I miss my flight by six minutes six minutes I felt a little like the movie left behind you remember the old movie left behind it says uh, there's no time to change your mind. The plane has come and <laughs> you've been left behind. That's kind of the way I felt. But the ticket, I went up to the ticket person. And I said, what am I going to do? You know, uh, is there another flight? Well, yes, sir, there is another flight. It will leave in two and a half hours. And I said, well, what gate is it? <laughs> a... 10. I said, you mean 66 gates back the way I just came? Yes, sir, but don't worry. You have two and a half hours to get there. <laughs> At that moment, I wanted something better. In Sunday school this morning in our study of Hebrews 6 verses 1 through 8, we learned that Rejecting Christ leads to hopelessness. And God has a design for us. And, and our rejection of him leads to hopelessness and brokenness. We try all sorts of things to fix our brokenness that doesn't work. But we can never fill that God-sized void that's within us that God intended to only be filled by him. And as we strive to live according to God's design with his help, we are called to share with others a journey that we've taken from brokenness through repentance and belief so that we will begin to pursue him and recover from the brokenness as he puts us back together. And that brings us to where we're at today. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 12 of Hebrews, the sixth chapter. And I hope you turn there because we're going to be talking today about what are the better things that we were meant for. Better things than sin, better things than brokenness and all that comes with that. Better things than what the world has to offer that doesn't satisfy us. And I hope before you leave here today or before you turn the channel on the TV that you will want the better things that God has for you and wants you to have. Before I read the scripture and before we pray, 
what do you need to hear a word from God about today? Ask him. When we enter into prayer in just a moment, say, Lord, I need to hear a word from you about this. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of you will speak to that need. If you are not saved here today and you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, then the first thing he's going to say to you is, you need to be saved. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And when we come to the end of the service, one of three things are going to happen. One, you might reject what God has said to you today. Or you might rejoice with God that, hey, I'm already doing that, and God is just affirming and encouraging me to keep on doing what I'm doing. Or maybe you'll decide to make changes. Maybe you'll, God will instill in you the tweaks that you need to make to receive those things things that we were meant for let's look at God's word beginning with verse 7 of chapter 6 of the book of Hebrews the Bible says in verse number 7 for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God but if it bears thorns and briars it is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned but beloved we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany, accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you asking that you will speak through your messenger. Lord, forgive me of anything that might stand in the way of your message coming through. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will speak through me and speak to the hearts of each and every person that is watching by television or in this building today. And that, Father, they will choose to align themselves with the word that you've spoken to their hearts and minds today. Lord, we want to be in agreement with you. And we know that with that agreement comes your blessing and your provision. And Lord, I pray that you allow this message uh, of uh, expounding upon your word to be such that it will help us all to move into agreement with you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let's begin by better thing number one. Better thing number one is found in verses seven and eight. And Better thing number one is bearing, which leads to blessing. Bearing. What are you talking about, Bob? Bearing here. Well, let me go back and, 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 and put this in context. Verse 7 says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful by those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. A person who bears useful fruit receives blessing from God. And the example they give is when the ground soaks up the rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. God's blessing is one of the better things that he wants to give us. You may say, well, how is it that we bear fruit? Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus said in John 15, verses 4 through 5, and then verses 7 through 8, he said this, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. I'm going to skip verse 6 for a minute. If you abide in me, verse 7, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. So what does that say to a Christian? What are we supposed to do to bear fruit? Number one, we are to be a disciple. Number two, we are to... Uh, uh, enter into working with the Lord, him working through us to accomplish his mission, which was to seek and save those who are lost. And then we are to allow God to use us to make other disciples. Greg Laurie writes this, what is bearing fruit? Essentially, it is becoming like Jesus. Spiritual fruit will show itself in our lives as a change in our character and our outlook. As we spend time with Jesus and get to know him better, his thoughts will become our thoughts, his purpose will become our purpose, and we will become like Jesus. And I use this verse a lot, but it is, 
it is an example of the fruit of the Spirit that should be coming out of each and every one of us. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of those things are produced in us so that we will be able to be disciples, seek and save those who are lost in Jesus' name, and to help allow him to use us to make other disciples. Now, a person who bears useless fruit is rejected by God and burned. We see that in verse 8. Notice what it says in verse 8, Hebrews 6 and verse 8. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Jesus back in John 15 6 said this, if anyone does not abide in me he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. The point is a person who bears useless fruit is rejected by God and burned. So when we come to know the Lord Jesus one of the proofs, one of the evidence, the, the evidence that shows that we are saved people is that God is using us to bear useful fruit. And as we've shared, bearing useful fruit means that we are doing our part to bear love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and to use that to lead others to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Rick Warren wrote this when he was explaining John 13, 17. It says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. He said, it is self-deception when we merely listen to God's word and don't let it change us. We think that just gaining knowledge makes us spiritually mature. But the test of maturity is not knowledge. The test of maturity is character. A lot of people have great Bible knowledge, but they are spiritual midgets. We need to put God's word into practice and we need to continually apply it in our lives. God blesses our agreement with him to bear good fruit. So it's not, it's not that we know everything that's in this book. And now it's good to know it. And, but, but the point is to take what he says in this book and apply it in our lives so that he can use us to bear good fruit. Bearing good fruit is it. That's our point for being here. It's our purpose for being here. If we're not accomplishing that purpose, then we've missed the point of Christianity altogether. Now, I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. I'm saying that to change your life for God. Because that's what he expects. Bearing useful fruit leads to God's blessing. Well, then what else happens? Well, the better thing number two is found in verses 9 and 10. Love which leads to ministry. Love that leads to ministry. Verse 9, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Well, what accompanies salvation? Though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Loving others is a sign that the love of God is in us. If we do not have the love of God in us and we are not treating others with the love of God the way Jesus would treat them, then we don't have, we either don't have the love of God in us or we are totally rejecting it and ignoring it. You see, the love of God in us that comes along with salvation leads us to ministry. For God is not unjust to forget your work, it says in verse 10, and labor of love which you have shown toward his name. Now the opposite of love is one of two things. It's either hate, well I hate you, or indifference. I don't even care enough to look your way. That's the opposite of love. But love, God's love, agape love, means I am going to allow God through me to minister to those that I come in contact with and the saints of the church. Loving God is evidenced by the ministry we have done and are doing. Well, visiting the different ministry sites that uh, I was uh, called to visit this past week in Boston, uh, a lot of our young uh, missionaries are are starting churches from scratch in the city where there's not very many Southern Baptist churches. And these guys are coming right out of school and, 
and they, I mean, they start with themselves and their family and, and they start in their homes and they invite other people that they are uh, sharing Jesus with and they start Bible studies and, and, and they grow from there. You would be amazed. If you could just hear what I heard this past week, you would go, yes! There's some great things happening. Let me give you an example. One of the things that the new church planters do is they begin the Bible study in their home and when they get to a certain number, they look for someplace else to meet larger. They are not into building buildings because you know how hard it is to build a building in Marion, but could you imagine how hard it would be to afford to build a building in Boston, Massachusetts? No, I just, it's just almost impossible. So what they do is, is they meet in homes as long as they can, and then they go and they volunteer their services in different areas. This one uh, uh, guy uh, uh, volunteered. He and his church said, we're going to the Boys and Girls Club, and we're going to see if we can do something there. So they began volunteering there. Volunteering. They, their rent that they were paying to meet was $28,000 a year. $28,000 a year. And they were meeting in a little, not, not in the boys club, but they were meeting in just a little place. After a while, the boys and girls club director came to this guy and said, you know, you, I, you, you have a church, don't you? And he said, yeah. I said, where do you meet? And he says, well, we're meeting over here and, you know, we're about to outgrow that space. And he says, well, pff, we're not open on Sunday. Three McKee and said, just meet here. And so they are meeting in a gymnasium now. And their little group of 40 has now grown to over 100 because they chose to allow the love that they had for others to turn into ministry. Another one was telling the story. He had some basketball experience. So he went to the local middle school and volunteered his services to help coach basketball. And so he was he'd done that for about a year, and he thought, you know, we would really like to have a Christian soccer clinic, but we don't have any place to do it. So he thought tried to get up his courage to go talk to the athletic director of the school and say could we use one of your fields we, we just want to use one of your fields so he goes into the office and and the guy telling the story said well you know I'm from North Carolina and I'm not always used to the gruff point blank Bostonian way of telling people stuff you know so I was a little went in with a little fear and trepidation as I was walking into his office. So I walk into his office and I'm starting to, no uh, to knock but the door was open and he looks up at me and goes, what do you want? And he said, I felt like melting, you know. But he says, I walked up and he says, well, uh, sir, I, I think you know who I am. I, I volunteer to tear here. Yeah, I know who you are. What do you want? Well, sir, we're thinking about starting a having a this summer a free clinic a Christian uh, free clinic a soccer clinic and I was just wondering you know if it wouldn't be too much trouble for us to maybe uh, use one of the fields here okay what else you need he said at that moment I wanted to do my happy dance but he asked me what else do I need I had not thought about what else do I need it did not even enter my mind. So I went, well, well, how about equipment? You got any equipment? No? Okay, you can use our equipment. H how about, you got any help? Well, no, just our church. I'll tell you what, I'll assign the high school uh, soccer team to come into the middle school and help you and uh, do it. Okay. Anything else you want? Well, uh... He said, well, how about you get me a flyer and I'll make sure every middle school student before they leave this summer will get a flyer about this claim. Does that work for you? Yes, sir. It will work for me. <laughs> he said as he was leaving, thank you and your church for volunteering here at this school. It makes a difference. Listen to what Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all. Love of God in us leads to ministry to others outside of our little realm. And when they do that, I went to a church I don't have time to tell you about everything I saw, but I, just to let you know, there's one of our church plants that started 10 years ago, one mile from Harvard University. 
started from scratch, one mile from Harvard University. That church has grown so much that they are now running three services every Sunday morning and filling up a, a church building that holds about 300 people. These are people who are going to run the world in about six, eight years. Their IQs are off the, off, off the, off the, the scales. And you may think, well, you know, intellectual people, they don't, they don't believe in Christ. That's <laughs> what you think. There is a missionary there from Nepal who came in and also meets in that church. And he has come over here. There's so many people from Nepal that lives in the Boston area that he's already started six congregations of people from Nepal there. And he came here to study so he could go back to his country and start churches. But God had a different thing in mind. God decided he wanted them to teach these Harvard students from Nepal and win them to Jesus and send them back. And as a result of sending them back, they've started nine churches in Nepal. Somebody say amen because that's a big deal. That is a big, big, big deal. They need churches there. There wasn't any. That's how you change the world. So after hearing this, what is God saying to you? What are you involved in that God would like for you to view as a ministry? What, what people do you spend time with away from the church that God wants you to minister to and to pray for and to seek and save those who are lost and make disciples? out of them. So we see those are some of the better things, the purposeful things that God had in mind for those who are saved. Bearing uh, useful fruit that leads to blessing. Love that leads to ministry. But then better thing number three is diligence which leads to hope. Look at verse 11 with me. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. In other words, trust God. It is God's desire that we choose Diligence. Well, what's the definition of diligence? Careful and persevering in carrying out tasks or duties. Steady effort. Attentive care. It means that allowing God to work through you, you keep on keeping on with the basics of what God has called us to do. That is in opposition to what we're going to see in verse 12 where it says, do not be sluggish, do not be dull, which is a word that I'll talk about in just a moment. In other words, we, when we become Christians, we are to agree with God for him to use us and we should do due diligence. Due diligence. What does that mean? Well, due diligence means the care that a reasonable per person exercises to avoid harm to other persons or their property. The positive thing of that in Christianity is Due diligence is the care that a follower of Christ would freely give to show the love of Christ as we agree with Christ to work through us to do that particular ministry. Due diligence is to determine what would Jesus do and agree with him, agree with him that he will accomplish miraculous things through us. Hillsong has a, has a chorus that goes like this. Some hope in chariots, some hope in wealth. My hope is in Jesus and nothing else. Oh, such love, such love and grace. Lead me to seek my Savior's face. Some hope in armies and in strength of men. My hope is in Jesus who calls me a friend. He bears me up if I should fall. My everything. Jesus is my all in all. Now get this one. Some hope in fortune. Some hope in fame. My hope is Jesus. Salvation's name. Ooh, I like that. For there he hung and bore my sin that I might live and bear his name. Due diligence. How can grateful people do less? For a true follower of Christ, due diligence is loving others based on the hope that we have in Christ. And we hand out that hope to them. Because I see so many people today who have no purpose. They have no hope for a better future. The preferred future which God has in store for each one of us. Assurance comes from diligence. If we are diligent in living for Christ, our hearts are filled with assurance. 
Specifically, we are to show our diligence to our full assurance of hope. There is a glorious day of redemption coming. One of these days, we were singing about it a while ago, one of these days, the trumpet is going to sound and, 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 and all of the saints are going to be called home to be with Jesus, not just for a time, but forever and ever and ever. And the way to keep from falling is to take precaution. We must be diligent in our hope for salvation and sharing that hope while ministering to people. So better things, better things hope. We are to bear useful fruit that leads to blessing. We are to love that leads to ministry. We are to be diligent that leads to hope. But the last thing and the better thing, number four, faith leads us to an inheritance. Look at verse 12. That you do not become sluggish. That, that's slothful. That's dull. That, we've, we've talked about that word in another uh, uh, portion of Hebrews. We are not to be lazy in our walk with Christ. But here's what we're supposed to do. We are to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We are to imitate all of those in the Bible who lived by faith and not by sight. They put their faith in God and they did what was right no matter what the world said for them to do. No matter what their peers are doing. They made the decision to live by faith. And living by faith means that you will inherit the promises that come because there is a reward for faith. Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, then the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified. My son Joshua is here today. My son Joshua is not expecting an inheritance from his dad. You know why? Because there isn't anything except I have shared Jesus with him and he knows Jesus and he has Jesus in his life and he is a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. That's the best inheritance because see, we only here for 70, 80, 90 years, you know, but he's going to be there in the Father's house forever. But Robin and I are spending his inheritance right now of the best we can and praying that when we get too old to do anything else, he will have money. <laughs> That's why we encouraged him to go to school and learn all he could. My younger son, on the other hand, he told me one time as I was talking to the boys in their teen years, I said to them, now boys, you're going to have to save up your money to take care of your mom and dad when they're old. Josh just kind of looked at us and shook his head a little bit. Luke looked at us and says, no worries, Dad. I'll make sure you get extra jello on jello day in the nursing home. Don't worry. <laughs> my hope is in my older son who is here today, and my faith is in God. I shared with you some time ago that there is a phrase that I keep in my head that uh, that I heard someone say, and I, and I shared that with you. And, and the phrase is, dude, I've got this. And I, I picture God saying that to me whenever I get into situations that are, that are, that are trying, and situations that, that have me nervous and, and fearful and scared. I, I just remember that voice of God comes into my head and says, dude, I got this. It was time for me to fly back home. While I was in Boston, I had a wonderful time of meeting with people and, and praying and, and, and doing all the mission stuff that I was supposed to be doing there. But then it came time to fly home. And my first flight out of Boston was, remember I flew to Detroit and I flew in? So where do you think they flew me this time to get home? Atlanta! At least Detroit was kind of on the way, you know, kind of on the way. No, I go south of Atlanta. So I get to Atlanta. By the time I get to Atlanta, I'm looking at my connecting flight from St. Louis back to Marion, and I'm realizing that I'm going to miss my flight. I'm going to miss my flight. What am I going to do if I miss my flight? So I'm in Atlanta, standing in line, getting ready to get on the plane, and I'm on my cell phone, and I called the uh, National Helpline for Cape Air, our little, fly, our little puddle jumper plane here in, uh, in, uh, in Marion. And so I called up, and I talked to this guy, and I said, look, I'm, I, you know, 
I, the way it looks right now, I've talked to everybody, it looks like I'm going to have about 15 minutes once I land on the ground. Could you tell me what gate I am going to come into and what gate that I am going to fly out of? Well, let me just a minute, sir. Let me check it. Oh, you never want to hear that. Oh, I know that Lambert Airport. You are flying into gate A. Okay, I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be A76. No, it's not even in the, in the terminal that is gate A. You're in gate, your flight out is in gate C. And you may have to go through security again. I'm thinking, oh, man, I, I, I wanted to go home. I'd been gone. I wanted to go home. So I began to, I got into my seat, and I'm stressing out, and I'm, you know, just upset and trying to figure out what am I going to do. And, and, you know, all of a sudden, that phrase came into my mind. Dude, I got this. I mean, even though, you know, before I had to wait two and a half hours, I still got to where I was going to go, and everything was good. I got there uh, a little bit late, but I, but I did get there. So I'm sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? Plan A, make my flight. Not likely, but that's my plan A. Plan B, rent a car. By this time, it's uh, like 10 o'clock at night. I'm thinking, I don't know. If I'll, I don't even know if the rent car places will be open or not. And then next to me, there was a guy sitting there who was also from St. Louis, and, and he looked at me and says, man, you look bummed out. And I said, well, you know, here's my deal. And he said, well, you know, uh, I work for Boeing now, but I used to work for uh, Enterprise Rental Car. They're open 24-7. And, and here, let me give you a number. You, you know, here, here's who you can call. And I'm saying, well, wow, that, that was encouraging. You know, I didn't want to have to rent a car and pay money and drive home. I wanted to make my flight, but that was a good plan B. And then plan C was my son in Edwardsville who would drive over and get me. I still had no way home, but, you know, at least I would have a place to stay if I needed to, you know, with him and my grandpuppy uh, that lived there. So, the plane lands. And I try to get off the plane. I had 15 minutes. It took me five minutes to get off of the plane because people were, you know, I was helping people get their luggage out and, and, you know, five minutes just to get from, of course, I was in roll 31, you know. I was just behind, you know, the back part of the plane with the rest of the animals where they you know, put them in, in storage. And, and I'm way back there. I'm trying to get out of the plane. I get out of the plane and I go up to the ticket counter and I say, ma'am, I need to get hold of Cape Air. Could you tell me how to do that? And she said, there's no need, sir. And I'm thinking, well, you're a paragon of hope, you know. Uh, there's no need, sir. I believe that, uh, that guy over there with the uh, yellow uh, stripes on his uh, shirt uh, is, is waiting for you. And I look up, and there's this guy smiling at me, you know. And I walk over to him, he says, and he's, and he's yelling out, anybody going to Marion, Illinois? Anybody going to Marion, Illinois? Anybody going to Marion? I am going to Marion, Illinois. Who are you? He said, well, I'm from Cape Air, and I have come to get you. So not only did I not have to go through security, he took me through all these coded doors, through these secret passages, you know, took me out to the runway and put me on a van. I wanted to hug the big dude with yellow stripes. Just didn't look like the huggable type. But, you know, I thought about it, you know, and I said, oh, I'm so, thank you so much, thank you so much, thank you so much, and he put me on this van and he took me around and, and took me back through some secret passages to get up to the ticket counter and I get up there and I walk in the door and the guy in the yellow stripes says here he is and the lady there said Mr. Dickerson we've been expecting you we're going to leave in about five minutes if you need the restroom it's right over there a double blessing I've been on the plane for two hours my God does exceedingly abundantly more than we asked for. I had five minutes. So after the restroom, I'm sitting there. I call Robin and I said, okay, you call Josh. Tell him everything's good. I said, honey, I'm coming home. 
God is good. And he used Cape Air to bless me. And as I hung up and began to thank God for his provision, God's voice came into my head. I told you, dude, I got this. (laughs) The point, it's the end of the service. I said a few moments ago, you may reject the Lord's plan altogether. I hope not. I, I have prayed not. Maybe you'll rejoice with God because that is what you are already doing in your life. You are already bearing useful fruit that leads to blessing. You are already in, so in love with God that you're letting that love lead you to ministry. You may already be diligent that leads to hope for you and hope for others. You may be a faithful person that leads to inheritance. Or maybe in some of those areas you need to decide to make some changes and come in line with what God has said to you today. The first step is always salvation. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Ask yourself and God this question. Are you ready to go to heaven? Or are you unsure of that? You see, God wants to speak to you right now. If you don't know Jesus and you don't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, then here's what you need to do. You need to repent and go God's way. That's what repentance means to turn from your way, take God's way, and say, I'm sorry for going my way all this time. Now I want to go your way now. Belief is next. Believe in him. Believe in him. Just say, I believe that you lived on this earth, you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe, Jesus, that you were the son of God, and I am willing to say that to you. The next step is simply to confess him as your Lord. Pray to receive him into your life. Lord, please, I confess you as my Lord. Please come into my life and save me right now. I want to be one of your children. I want to be one of your disciples. I want to be saved for purpose. If you've never prayed that prayer, then just ask God to save you right now. If you need some help, we'll have people here at the altar to help you do that. Maybe you're here today and you've realized that you're saved, but for some reason you've become a spectator instead of a participant in what God had intended for you to do. So maybe right now you just need to say, Lord, I want to come in line with whatever it is you want me to do. Lord, I want to produce useful fruit. Lord, I want to be part of of a ministry. Lord, I want to be diligent to provide hope for others, the same hope I have in my assurance with my relationship with you. Lord, faith. I want to have the kind of faith that just knows that I know that I know that I know that someday I'm going to receive an inheritance from you, a real inheritance. And I'm going to live in the house of the Lord forever. Maybe God's going to call you to come to this altar today. And if he does, we'll have somebody here to pray with you and to help you to decide what it is that God's called you here for. If you're at home watching this on television, you call that number and somebody will call you back just as soon as we can to minister and help you and pray with you. Father, I pray for this invitation. I pray, Father, that you will just touch the hearts of those that are in here. Lord, to know that you have my life in your hands is such a joy and comfort. Oh, yeah, you got to remind me that you've got this. But, Lord, when you do and I see it, I get so excited. I want to tell everybody about it. When we step out on faith, you're always there. You're always there. And you want to lead us. And I thank you for that. So, Lord, allow your Holy Spirit to speak clearly to those that are in this building. Because, Father, you have that kind of ministry for every person here. It will be different. But it's still something that you've called them to do. Help them to figure it out. Speak to them clearly. And let this invitation be just exactly what you want it to be. And if there's any lost people here that doesn't know Jesus, I pray, Father, that you will send them down today to come to know the Savior who died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead, and is our Savior. It's in his name I pray. Amen.